See you. 
Yes and amen, all your promises. All your promises are yes and amen. You know, the promises that we uh, we ask for, we pray for, sometimes they're always not in the way we expect them. And so when we sing that, all your promises are yes and amen, that can be intimidating because maybe we don't get that promise that we want it to happen, but his ways are always higher than our ways. So all of his promises are yes and amen, and always for your good. He causes all things to work. And I will rest in your promises, my confidence. Is your faithfulness, and I will rest in your promises. My confidence is your faithful. I will rest, and I will rest in your promises. My confidence is your faithfulness. And I will rest in your promises, my confidence. Oh, is your faithfulness, and I will rest in your promises, my confidence. Is your faithfulness, and I will. In your promises, my confidence is your faithfulness, faithful and faithful. You are faithful forever, you will be faithful. You are. Promises are yes and amen. All your promises are yes and amen. All your promises are yes and amen. I just want to give a testimony, Heather. Um, so singing the song, um, I went through some stuff this past two weeks that was really hard for me. Um, and I just want to say everything that is in this song is true. Everything is in, in this song. He's given me grace. He's pulled me out of the darkness. Um, he's taught me things <laughs> this week that I might not want to have been taught, but he's done it. And I love this song today. I didn't realize it when I was singing it the first time, but as we're singing it now, everything is true. And I thank him so much for how he's just been with me and been beside me. My husband wasn't there for some of it, but God was there. And I know he, that's how God intended it and God wanted it, but he is so faithful. To sing faithful. Faithful you are. say this too that in your grief 
when it when there's no words sometimes you just can't even listen to music god is there all you have to do is reach out and and i just feel like if anyone here is just suffering that grief or suffering that pain just reach out i'll tell you when you're going through it it's hard but god is there Lord, we just pray for a spirit of faith, confidence for those this morning that may struggle, those that have worries and fears and discouragement. Lord, we pray for a spirit of faith this morning. We pray for confidence, oh God, to be built. Lord, that there would be a wellspring of your goodness that would uh, well up within the inner man, the inner person, oh God. And it would produce faith in those that are in trial, those that are uh, uh, sick maybe, or those that are discouraged, whatever it may be, we pray for a spirit of faith, oh God. Lord, that they could reach out and they could put their hope in you who do not change. You're faithful in every circumstance. All of your promises are yes and amen. Lord, we pray, let faith arise. In that spirit that's discouraged, in that spirit that feels weak, Lord, come with the power of your Holy Spirit and blow your breath of refreshing and hope and joy and peace and confidence into that heart, we pray. We thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for your, that you're a God of restoration. You're a God that takes us through to the other side. You're a God of confidence. You're a God that we, we can trust in in every circumstance. Thank you, Lord God. We pray for the sick this morning. We pray for healing. We pray for your presence to touch and strengthen. Glory to your name, Lord. Lord, I pray you'd put a word of praise in the lips of your people, Lord. As they stand in faithful in your faithfulness, Lord, that your faithfulness would become a spirit of praise and thanksgiving going back to you, O oh God. We bless your name. We praise your name. Hallelujah. For you are worthy. You are faithful. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Worthy, you are worthy. Much more worthy than I've known. I cannot imagine just how glorious you are I cannot begin to tell how deep a love you bring Lord my ears have heard of you but now my eyes have seen your So high above the heavens, your 
week to week, month to month, and year to year? Am I not the faithful one? So I say to you, fear not. Fear not, for I am thy Lord and thy God. Hale ma hane na na hane, ye da ba han da da ha she da ba hate. But lo, if you are ashamed of me, lo, saith God, may I shall be ashamed of you before God your Father. Ba ki da go shi da go shate, ele be he na na ma han mo he li na hali ebe she. Great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written, Jesus Christ, my living. So great a mercy, what heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken. 
encouragement and grace and confidence in God's provision and so thank you Lord for that uh, this is why we gather <laughs> and we want the presence of God to speak to us and minister to us so we're going to prepare for communion um, I want to read a passage from Peter and then our communion passage um, <clears throat> this is second Peter Chapter 1, verse 3, it says, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence, by which He has granted to us precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desires. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brother, brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours 
and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. As we prepare for communion, breaking bread, the Lord's Supper, I just wanted to read that. Communion reminds us that we were cleansed from our former sins. And it reminds us it wasn't our work, it wasn't our effort, it was completely His. And I believe from that place of humbleness and recognizing that the work is Christ, the forgiveness was His work, uh, the death on the cross, His shed blood is all His doing. And when we acknowledge that, we live in that, all those qualities that Peter talks about, the, the divine nature can come out in our lives. How? Through completely trusting in the work of Christ. And what a rich thing it is. And Jesus himself gave us this before he went to the cross. He said, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. He did that because we need this. <laughs> we need a remembrance. We need to remember where we came from. We need to remember his grace in our lives. We, remember, we need to remember it's not by works of righteousness that we are saved, but according to his mercy. We need to remember mm -hmm. that we were saved from our former sins. Mm -hmm. We've received mercy. We're a people who have received. Once we were not a people, but now we are the people of God. Once we had not obtained mercy, but now we have mercy. And it's all because of the work of Christ. Can we rejoice in that this morning? Amen. Woo. God is good. Amen. Amen. So I'm just going to read what Paul gave us here in Corinthians. <clears throat> Maybe um, that's all right. We'll leave that right just, just like it is. So we, we have communion. We have uh, this is our. Our, our new technique we developed during this uh, COVID time. <laughs> Two cups. The first cup on top is juice. The cup underneath it is the bread. So they're somewhat self-contained. Um, but let's read together. Let's stand as we read the communion passage. Um, and then uh, once you come forward and, and pick up your bread and juice, let's just hang on to it till we all get together. We'll pray and we'll partake together. Uh, of the bread and the juice. So the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three, 23, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Lord, today we stop. Yes, we examine ourselves. We see that we're frail earthen vessels, lost and undone without your grace. Mm -hmm. But we also see you are our provision. Mm -hmm. You're the hope. You are our living hope. Mm -hmm. You are the one who set us free. And so this morning as we prepare to follow your commandment and do this in remembrance of you, we're, 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 our hearts are full of thanksgiving. Our hearts are full of joy. That it's not by works which we have done, but it's according to your mercy. So we come with humility. We come in faith. We come remembering our past that you've brought us out of. And we come thanking you for your goodness. Bless our hearts. Let your presence be real and powerful as we partake, as you have called us to partake. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.
You can come forward, as I said, bring your cup maybe back to your seats, and then we will all partake together after everybody um, gets back. Broken every day, The wonderful thing about communion is it's communal. That's why that word's in there. That's the wonderful thing about the body of Christ, (laughs) is we're called together in all of our differences and unique personalities and different uh, viewpoints from life. We're all brought together under that one common bond, and that's Christ. And so when we partake, we profess and confess that we are partakers of Christ, Christ in us, the hope of glory. And as you partake, Christ in you, and I partake, Christ in me, that means we're together. (laughs) That's the uniqueness of the body of Christ. We're all brought together through faith in Christ, and we partake of Christ together. And so what I uh, love in you and value in you and pray for you is because of Christ in you and Christ in me. Isn't that great? Let's stand for a moment. We'll partake together. Just t- take a look around. This is the body of Christ. Body of Christ. 
online. We love you too. You can see us. We can't see you. Um, but be thankful for his body that he died for the church. And we are his church together. So let's partake of the bread in recognition of his broken body. cup of new covenant in his blood that cleanses us and makes us righteous. Thank you, Lord God. Lord, we pray uh, as we partake, your presence is here. So we stop in your presence, Lord. thank you for the body of Christ. We thank you that you've knit our hearts together. Continue to do that in a greater way. Continue to make us bright lights, the people of God, walking hand in hand, joined in you, Lord. We thank you for it. Uh, strengthen every heart, every life, because of your broken body and your shed blood. Our faith is in you and in you alone. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you. Um, I don't know if we were going to sing or I think what we'll do, maybe we'll just go ahead and do our offering. Okay. <laughs> Didn't plan that one too well, but hallelujah. So I think what we'll do is uh, take a moment. We have an offering basket here, one in the back if you'd like to give. Uh, if you're online, obviously you have options there. I don't know how to do it, but you know, I do somewhat. I have to have coaching. <laughs> uh, but uh, we'll receive an offering, and then we're going to invite the children downstairs, and then we'll have a message. So let's stand, and I'll pray over the offering, pray for our kids. Lord, we thank you. Uh, that we can give, we can give with cheerful hearts. We pray that you bless the gift, bless the giver, bless our children and the teachers. We love you, Lord. We praise you. All your promises are yes and amen over your people. Amen. God be with you. Oh, yeah. 
promises are yes and amen. All your promises are yes and amen. All your promises. All your promises are yes and amen. All your promises are yes and amen. Okay, we're back after that commercial break. <clears throat> uh, so I, a couple, I get maybe just one quick announcement. I didn't get a list of announcements, but I do know about this. Um, so we're, uh, Mercy Team, if anybody's interested in learning about or being a part of Mercy Team, which is really a team that's going to just come together to meet needs in the body, whether it's shut-ins or people going through trauma or situations or people needing meals. Uh, there could be a multitude of things that fall under that. But uh, so today, immediately following service in the kids' church room downstairs, we're going to gather there and just uh, kind of talk about what it is, how it's going to work. And, uh, yeah, so that is today, immediately following the, ser the service. Prayer, we've been meeting on uh, Wednesday nights, but I, this, so we did in the evening for the month of uh, uh, January, thank you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyways, um, starting this Wednesday, we're going to go back to Wednesday mornings, so uh, Wednesday morning at 8.30, we gather for prayer. And if you're not, you know, if you're someone who's an evening person, you really want an evening prayer meeting, you holler to us and we will make arrangements. And, or, you, you know, we'll, we'll find others that want to meet in the evening for a, a midweek prayer meeting. Um, but really, uh, I just want to say I'm thankful to the group that comes every Wednesday morning and has been doing it for a number of years. And, uh, and I just feel like that God works in that place, right? It doesn't mean everybody has to be there, but there's faithful people praying. And so that will go back to Wednesday morning uh, this week at 8.30. So um, I'm feeling like I lost my glasses. My wife happened to bring an extra pair with her today. So <clears throat> I think that was all of our... Oh, there's my glass. Uh, <laughs> no, I don't need glass. Thank you. If I need it, I'll grab it. But um, 
So yes, hot chocolate uh, at the Winter Carnival Parade, which is February 12th. Uh, if we anybody else wants to sign up for that, the, there's a sign-up sheet in the back. Basically, we gather a few people here early. We load up the truck, get everything on tables. We have a big sign we put up. We have a couple tables. Uh, and then we have to pick up donuts, have to make hot chocolate, and then Usually we start handing things out around 10, 30, 11, right across from Little Italy, Riverside Park. And usually before the parade starts, everything's gone. So <laughs> it's not like an all-day thing. Everybody's walking to the parade, and they all want a cup of hot chocolate or some, and a donut. And so it goes reasonably fast. But, uh, yeah, we can always use more volunteers. So there's a sign-up for that. And also for the rail jam, which we do at Mount Pisgah, uh, there's two aspects to that. Usually Wednesday night, we go there in the evening and we do work to make to put rails in the snow for the kids to hit with their snowboards. It's a long story. Uh, and then the actual event is Friday night, the 18th. We need people there. We kind of have a we have a prize table. We have uh, if any of you are good judges, you could judge the event for us if you know how to do tricks on snowboards. Uh, <clears throat> so there's a sign up for Rail Jam also back there. And these are just two opportunities for us to uh, reach into the community. And um, they've been great, uh, actually, ministries over the years for us to, to accomplish. So, um, okay, that's all of my announcements, I think, for now. So last week, we, uh, we talked about, maybe I can get on here and see what happens with my phone. We talked about kind of in a general way vision and mission of the church, and we talked about the fact that we uh, uh, are moving towards building <clears throat> and why a visible church is important um, in, a, in a community um, and why it's a it's, uh, vital uh, aspect of a healthy community is faith-based, Christ-centered uh, groups that gather and actually uh, are a light and our salt and influence our community. And so we don't want to be hidden. We, I, uh, the, we want to be visible. We want to be the visible church in a community. And so I, we kind of went through that uh, <clears throat> discussion, and there's a lot to that. I do feel uh, personally strongly that the visible church is, is vital uh, uh, to our nation and to our culture and our society, um, and that it should continue uh, for many, many years to come until the Lord returns. So, but I wanted to, there was a quote there that I used last week. Because, let's go to the quote. Maybe, is it up near the top of my, I can't, mine, mine's not loading here, so I can't. Uh, maybe it will. Look up for your help. Your redemption draweth nigh. I'm just looking to see if this is going to load, but it doesn't look like it's going to. Okay, so this is a quote I used last week, and it talks about, you know, the idea that church buildings uh, serve not only the worshiping members, but also the common good. They're visible emblems of Jesus' neighborly proximity and public outposts of God's kingdom in the city commons. Uh, I just love that idea. I'm sorry, I just have to say it again. <laughs> it's so great that God calls his people to, to, otherwise there's no, what influence do we have if there's not a moral value, values-based influence, faith-based influence, church, we have to do it. And church buildings have been that in our nation for, for many years, but not because of the building. And I guess that's one thing I think it's important it's real, it's, a, it's, a, it's something that should be visible and uh, seen. Whoops, did it go away? It did go away, but okay. So they're visible outposts of God's kingdom. But here's the part that I wanted to kind of talk about a little bit today. It says, church buildings, comma, when filled with the merciful people of God, are sanctuaries for downtrodden neighbors seeking refuge from the storms of life. 
Well, that's a pretty big caveat in there. What's, what's the caveat? The merciful people of God. <laughs> you, remember, you ever do that one, uh, you know that one, here's, here's the church, there's the steeple, open the doors, and there's all the people, maybe you did it differently. Well, sometimes people see the church, they see the steeple, they open the doors, and they're not very nice people. I hate to, I hate to say it. <laughs> That's the summary of what we're talking about today. Uh, if the church, the emblem of the church, the, the, the visibility of the church, and people say, oh, what do those people do? They go and they worship God on Sunday morning. They don't go, you know, whatever, and what's that about? And they come, the church needs to be filled with merciful people. <laughs> Sorry to exclamate, exclamate like that, but... <clears throat> This, uh, so the buildings, the pomp, I like, uh, I'll be honest with you, I like a little bit of ritual in my life. Uh, I like a little bit of uh, uh, the reality of communion. I like the idea of baptism. I like the, the orders and the functions of the church, but in the end, they're no good unless the people of God are really living in a place of Christ's love, grace, and communion, right? Right? So all those other things, as wonderful as they can be. Now, you can go across this nation now, and you can go into chapels and, and uh, churches that are just gloriously beautiful and wonderful, but empty. And then maybe sometimes they're not empty, but there's not a sense of the Holy Spirit. There's not a sense of God's presence. So as much as, and this is why I wanted to kind of do a point, counterpoint, as much as we see the value of the visible church, the invisible or the spiritual life of the church is vitally important uh, to how we are salt and how we are light in our community. So I wanted to read from Ephesians <clears throat> Chapter 4, verse 1. Um, and it begins with, uh, I therefore, this is the Apostle Paul speaking, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Uh, we'll go to the next couple of verses, then I'll go back. Um, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. And this is there verse 5. Is, yeah. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Um, so back to verse 1, if we could. Paul is, uh, first of all, talking about a call. And I just want to, I'll start here with this. Um, the first call to every human being, every person, everyone alive, everyone that hears the gospel message, is a call uh, to reconciliation with God through Christ. That's the call. Paul says uh, that we're ministers of reconciliation. And the call that goes out, and the, I believe what Paul's, this is like a, a general and a universal call to be reconciled unto God through his son. And this is the primary message, the primary thing that God is calling the world to, the culture to, and everybody we have association with there's a call to be reconciled to God, to be called unto God. Uh, and, of course, we know that the gospel message itself is, is a call. It's, it's used, that term is used many times, the gospel call or the invitation, right? It's an invitation to come and to know God. Uh, Jesus himself said, come unto me and I will give you rest. Come, all ye that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Um, so, first of all, Paul's talking about a call unto God himself. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, 
I urge you, and I always love to say that the King James in this particular uh, is stronger. It says, I beseech you <laughs> that you would walk worthy of the manner with which you have been called. In other words, <clears throat> uh, this calling is profound. This calling is powerful. This calling is beautiful. It's, it's the calling of heaven. And Paul is saying, this takes a response. This call requires a response. This call requires not just sidling along and walking along beside it, but this call is something that we give ourselves over to. Now, there's, there's many a people in culture and probably that sit in churches every week that hear the call in and out, but really just kind of walk along beside the call. There's a call that is profound and that requires a profound response. That's why Paul's urgency here. He says, I'm urging you, I'm beseeching you that you would walk worthy. This is, this is, uh, this is a high calling that, we're, that Paul is saying that we're called to. And it's a good thing I have two glasses of water today. Okay. So then the next thing, the next verse, the second slide, because my sermon slides are still loading here for some reason. And then he, then he gives a how. He says, walk with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now, <laughs> what, I wanna, what, I, what I believe is, What's his, what's uh, Dallas Willard? Mike gave me a, a book of his, and he has a, he has a section where he talks about, um, he talks about mean Christians, <laughs> believe it or not. Uh, have you ever heard of such a thing? I can't be. Um, but actually, it's more prominent than you think. Isn't that crazy? Uh, why does that happen? And uh, he, he actually talks about the fact that, um, well, I'll say this. This is a, this is a quote from another fellow. That I want to read this. The New Testament speaks often about churches, but it's surprisingly silent about matters that we associate with church structure and life. There's no mention of architecture, pulpits, lengths of typical sermons or rules for having Sunday school, Little is said about style of music, order of worship, times of church gatherings, no Bibles, no denominations, no camps, no Bible camps. And the, the point is, the church spends an awful lot of time on things that aren't spelled out very clearly in Scripture. <laughs> in other words, the church, if you want to see commotion and kerfuffle, it's usually about things that really isn't spelled out clearly in what we teach or in what Paul has taught. Church government is really somewhat vague in Scripture. We understand there are certain positions, there are certain ways that, that seem to be, but there's, if you look across denominations, there's, you know, there's at least five or six various types of church government that people have chosen to use. Uh, but those become big things. But the New Testament is rather silent. <laughs> And we spend, the point this fellow is making is we spend a lot of time on things that we don't necessarily have clear directives on from Scripture. Now, uh, um, I'll read a little bit more. Those who strive to be New, New Testament churches must seek to live its principles and absolutes but not reproduce the details. <laughs> uh, in other words, what are the principles and absolutes that we should seek? And what are the details that maybe we don't need to spend so much time and effort on? Um, I believe, just as we talked about in communion this morning, I believe the absolute is, the principles that we're called to live on, is that we all Every one of us are called to be like Christ. We're all called to Christ-likeness. And we're all called together to be like Christ. 
So these things, and, and you know, when this, and when uh, Dallas Willard wrote about, you know, the mean Christians, <laughs> um, Lord, don't let me ever be <laughs> put in that category, right? Um, he said the problem was is that that most Christians have been taught it's more important to be right than Christ-like. And therefore, and, 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 and I can understand it, okay? It, I'll just say this. When you're talking about matters of faith, you're talking about matters of polity and things that we think should be just so because, why? Because faith is very important. <laughs> and you have to do it right. And though we become very concerned about how we do it, and we should be to some degree, but we should be more concerned about the character of Christ in my heart that comes out as I care, go about making sure I'm doing it right. One, one uh, example he gave was uh, Warren Wearsby. I know uh, Eileen loves Warren Wearsby, wherever she is. <laughs> uh, she, she's, she's heard a lot of them is the point of that one. But uh, where he came and he was reading from a Bible that someone didn't think should have been read from um, for because of the version or whatever. And long story short, the person, he said, well, it's just what I thought expressed this portion well. And uh, the person stormed out, left the meeting. I will not sit under a teacher that uses that version of the Bible. <laughs> Angrily left, right? And the, of course, the, the unusual part is, is that scripture teaches us to be loving and kind and not let our anger, but rather the right version took precedent over the tone of their heart, <laughs> right? So that's the need to be right can be more important than being Christ-like. Now, I'm not, I don't think we have that problem here, uh, maybe with me, but nobody else. <laughs> I'm sure nobody else here has that issue. Um, <clears throat> but the point I'm making, if we're going to be a light and we're going to be a visibility uh, to the community and the world around, especially in the time that we're in. We need to be Jesus people. <laughs> we need to be those who love one another, who live in the grace of Christ, who are merciful people of God in the midst of an unmerciful world, right? Um, so when, when uh, as that last line said in that first quote, that uh, we're, we're a, a haven where the merciful people of God are found and those can come in, that's really what we want them to find is peace, mercy, love. And, of course, it starts um, with each other. It starts in the body of Christ. That's why communion is such, such a real and important part of worship for us because communion centers us back to the reality that we're all broken, we're all equally needy, and none of us have any rank over anyone else. It's only about Jesus. That's the beauty of communion, right? Um, <clears throat> pardon me. Number two. <clears throat> um, okay. So Paul, what he's saying is you have this great call, and here's what you're called to do. You're called to live with humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Eager. There is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called to one faith, one hope, that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all. Paul says, you're called out, but you're called into something. You're called into the body of Christ. You're called into the people of God. You're called into a place where you live in harmony and grace with other believers, and you become a light to the world around you. Now, if you look at Matthew 28, 19, this is the, the, the Great Commission. Um, go ye therefore, go therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, 
teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And this is an idea here that <clears throat> sometimes we want to make people disciples of our theology, our teaching, our way of thinking, rather than disciples of Jesus. <laughs> Right. And then that be, then that's where the right and the wrong pieces come in. We begin to say, well, wait a minute. What we're called to do is to make disciples of Christ. What we're called to do is that each one of us are on a path together. And the path that we're on is we're on a path to be shaped into the image of Christ. I don't know that as a pastor, uh, <clears throat> if I have effectively communicated or stressed or helped us all become more like Jesus. I hope so. But this is what we should be doing, <laughs> is becoming more like Christ. And we actually, we talked about this a little bit in the, when we were studying the book of Philippians the other night. Um, it's, 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 not simp it's not easy to be humble. It's not easy to say, it's not my will, but thine be done. Though This is how Christ-likeness takes shape in our lives. When we don't have to get our own way. When we don't have to have what we want. When we begin to say, it's okay. It's not about me. It's about the kingdom, right? That's where Christ-likeness takes place in our lives. So the call... Uh, to be a merciful people of God means that the people of God that are gathered together and we join in worship with one another is we're encouraging one another unto Christ-likeness. We're encouraging one another to be shaped and to be molded by the Holy Spirit so that our hearts and our minds and our lives become more and more like Christ. And as we do that together, as a whole, we become this beautiful, merciful people of God. Um, all right, I'm going to read a little more here, and then I'm going to read verse, uh, go down a little bit for, further in Ephesians 4. I hope I had that up there. I'm not sure if I do. Ephesians 4.11. So after it says, you know, Paul says, I beseech you, you've been called to this, this high calling. Uh, here's, how you should, here's how you should walk in it, though, with humility and uh, grace and eager to keep the unity of the Spirit, all of these things. Um, remember, it's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Uh, remember, Paul had to deal with that in uh, Corinthians because Paul had baptized some people and this one had baptized some people, and they were starting to have disagreements. Well, I was baptized by Paul, and I was baptized by Apollos. And Paul said, wait a minute. <laughs> you don't even know what you're doing here. It's not Paul or Apollos. It's Christ. And so that's what Paul, at the beginning of this, in Ephesians is saying. He said, you're called to this great call. You're called to unity, peace, because it's all about one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one Father of all. And then he talks about how Christ ascended, and then it, this is uh, what we often call the ascension gifts. He gave, when Jesus ascended, he gave gifts, is what it says. What did he give? He gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, some versions say pastors, and teachers. Now, we see these gifts But there's simply, there's no structure to them per se. There's very little in Scripture that explains, you know, some people like to make hierarchies and that becomes very, you know, hierarchies get problematic. From what I see in the kingdom, the last shall be first. So hierarchies are a little confusing sometimes in the kingdom. And there really wasn't any given here. Some, some see that and that's fine if you want to see it, but uh, the way we see it, here is that there's a team of leaders, and the team of leaders that may have those leadership giftings, the only thing they're here for is to help everybody else grow up into the things that God has called us all to be together. It's, it's not like it's this position of uh, 
preference and prominence, it's a, it, those are gifts that are given for what? Verse 12. To equip the saints, that's everybody, for the work of ministry so that the body of Christ can be built up. So when Paul says these are what these gifts are given for, the only reason there's a gift as a pastor is so that somehow God has given me a gift to help you thrive in your gift. The body is so important uh, to what we do and so important to how the kingdom works that we must understand that this is not a top-down kingdom, except Jesus. He's at the top. Everything points there. Let's read a little further. So he gave the apostles, prophets, evangelists. Why? To equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. And this is what he said. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. How far do we go? I don't remember what else I put on there. Is that the last verse? I think I, think I see a head nodding there. Okay, <clears throat> I'll read a little further on mine. To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. Um, So why do we have gifts and church leadership that Jesus gave? So that every person in the body can be shaped more like Christ. So that the gifts that are in every person um, are brought to the forefront and they are used in the kingdom. And the reason I'm saying this is because, and you guys know that I talk about this a lot, that that body, and, and I'll just I'll show you, tell you one of my weaknesses. Body ministry is really vitally important to the church. In other words, every gift has to function. And I talk about it a lot, but then sometimes I do everything. That's my weakness. <laughs> so you guys got to stop me sometimes and say, wait a minute, that's my gift. <laughs> but body ministry and everybody working together and the gifts that are in each individual life coming out is the way the kingdom of God is designed. And the merciful body of Christ functions the best when every part is doing its work. Isn't that awesome? That nobody has greater importance. I'm going to look at a couple passages quickly, and I don't know. uh, So we're we're called out. We're called into relationship with Christ. We're called to live as Christ-like people. But we're called as a community that is so interconnected that Paul likened it to the human body. We're so interconnected that Paul likened it to the human body. Now, that's, that's a dramatic uh, image because, you know, when, I, when you don't have one knee, <laughs> it doesn't work too good, right? We, the church, has learned to live pretty well without a lot of the parts of the body functioning. But Paul says and Christ says that we're all one. Isn't that amazing? We're one. I really need every one of you. And most of you need me. <laughs> I'll say everyone. I don't want to be. I was going to say it was my wife, but I didn't want to. <laughs> I did it anyways. Um, <clears throat> we need each other. That's the message here. And the only way this works is when we each live in a Christ-like manner. And we understand that it's not about me. It's, part, it's the reality that I'm a part of a bigger body. And our mission together, toe, foot, knee, etc., is all to glorify Christ. I used to tell this to the men in the jail because when you go into jail, you have guys from every walk of life, from different nations, different uh, inner city communities, Canada, whatever they were, different teachings, doctrines, but they all came on the same night because it was Christian Bible study. <laughs> but I would tell them, if we all have the same common goal, which is to lift up Christ, we're going to be okay here. <laughs> if it's about him, 
then we can find unity. We can find a way to glorify God. So we live together as this merciful community of people, and we're connected just like a body. That's what Paul says. That's why the image of communion is so important um, to recognize that we are all partakers of Christ together. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, 12, I'm going to, I keep saying I'm going to try to go quicker, but uh, sometimes I just got to do it. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 says, just as the body is one and has many members and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of that one spirit. So just as the body is one and has many members, we're the same way. We're one. <clears throat> Paul says that God gives value to every part of the body, even the members that don't seem as important. Isn't that funny? The church, anyways, I won't, I'll keep going. <clears throat> Paul, God gives value to every part of the body, even the members that don't seem that important. What's it, do you have 1225? I think that might be next. And he said, why? He says, so that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together in it. Now, <clears throat> that is, uh, that's a reality that we have to understand as we live together. That when one member suffers, the whole body suffers. And one member rejoices, we all rejoice together. Paul's saying, this is how interconnected you are. And unfortunately, in our uh, our modern culture, um, it's easy to not be connected. In other words, it's easy to come to church on Sunday. It's easy to sit and say, hi, how's it going? Everything's good. But really that connection where we understand and we, we sense that when someone's hurting, we feel that. When someone's, it, that's somewhat rare. I mean, it happens and it's there. But Paul's saying this is a reality whether you know it or not. This is the reality that we are all connected. And when one suffers, we all suffer. Sometimes we're not tuned into it, but it's a reality. We're called together as a merciful body of Christ. So Paul says, uh, first of all, we're interconnected like a human body. God gives value to every part of the body, even the members that don't seem as important. We're all so interconnected that when one member suffers, we all suffer. Um, I'll say this too. When one member is apathetic to the work of the Holy Spirit, it affects all of us. Just the way it is. Now, we're all apathetic at different times in our life. We need to encourage one another. We need to realize that we're, we're partners in this mission. The merciful people of God called together to be like Christ in the world that we're in. <clears throat> uh, so Paul says, we're all interconnected when one suffers, and the work of the kingdom will happen as it should because we are all called with one common purpose. As a faithful, Christ-centered community, we glorify Christ and expand the kingdom. Um, We're, I probably won't go into this too much. I'll just briefly say, uh, when we gather, there should be interaction. There should be ministry of the Spirit. Today, there was some ministry. We felt, we sensed together the presence of the Holy Spirit and God works. But it's, and it's been a little, it's been a little, it's a little difficult with what we've gone through for the last couple of years, this idea of being connected well and learning what that means. Um, but I, I want to encourage us that what it means and where it starts is for each one of us to look at our own lives 
and how we personally are being shaped into the likeness of Christ. I think that's where it begins. And if I'm being shaped into the likeness of Christ and you are, together we are the body of Christ, the merciful people of God, so that we are a refuge where people who have experienced God's mercy and we've experienced God's grace and we become a refuge for the community and the world around us. Um, I don't know if I gave that a good, good explanation, but I'll just think about it for a minute. <laughs> uh, in other words, as each one of us provoke one another unto love and good works, as each one of us uh, desire to live our life being transformed into the image of Christ, we do that together. That is the only way that we will be salt and light to the world around us. We can't, I love church music, I love everything about it. We can't do all that but not have what is, we're called to be, which is like Christ to one another and like Christ to the world around us. So what we do, three things I'm going to wrap up, is catch the vision of the kingdom. Remember, just like I said earlier, we remember where we came from. Remember that Christ died for our sins and rose again. And because of that, we live in this grace. We live in this mercy, this beauty of God. And listen to what Paul said, or take to heart what Paul said. Walk worthy. Walk ourselves up for the call that we're called to be like Christ. And then view our purpose. And I like this. Someone used this this uh, phrase once, and I kind of liked it. View your Christian walk as a path and not a box. View your Christian walk as a path and not a box. And as a church, we should view our life here as a journey and not a box. This is how we do it. This is how we've always done it. This is how we... God is taking us somewhere. <laughs> God is taking me personally to a place where I need to be transformed and changed more like him. And I can't be so satisfied to stay in the box that I'm in. And together, we grow in that. And then the other part I thought as, we, as, we, as I wrap this up, how do we be the merciful people of God? How do we represent well the kingdom of God? It's our, it's our first, our relationship with Christ and how our heart is being changed. And then together, our relationship with one another. Viewing the call that we have, the purpose, the vocation that God has called us to. Uh, seriously, understanding that the path, we're on a path, we're not in a box. And then being kingdom-minded. It's a simple thing, but it's easy to not be kingdom-minded. In other words... Uh, we, be, we get to look in our own, begin to look in our own little box. We begin to look at our own world. And how are we doing? How's this? We need to be as the people, as individually and as the people of God, kingdom minded. And that means uh, maybe our toes get stepped on. Maybe who knows what can happen. But always what's most important is the kingdom of God. And how is Christ being shaped in me? And I believe as a community, um, Heather, you guys can come this way if you want. Um, so my heart was, after I finished up last week, okay, we talked about the importance of the visible church, the presence of, of the church in the community, but the church has to be alive in Christ in all that we do. Otherwise, we have no life to give. And so communally, let's grow in Christ. Let's grow in Christ likeness. And be that beautiful light to the world around us um, in the weeks and months to come. I'm going to get out of your way.
promises never fail. prosper you open future and not just promise promises and you'll sing that today you the God we serve time for prayer here. I'm going to ask, Cindy had something on her heart that she felt like God wanted to incorporate in the prayer time. I'm going to ask her to share it, and you can just play softly if you would, and we'll uh, sing some more in a minute. When we um, were singing the Faithful You Are song earlier, um, and actually even as I watch some of you come in, the word impossibility um, came to my mind, and then we just sang, there's a line in the song we just sang. So that gave me the boldness to come and, and move here. And so this is what I'd like to see. There are some of you 
who have the gift of faith or the gift of healing, you know that's on your life. God has the Holy Spirit. You've seen people be healed when you've prayed. So you know who you are. And then there are others of you who you walked in this morning and you're facing something that's impossible. You've been told it's impossible or you just feel in your heart that <laughs> you're just facing something that's too big. Um, a week or so ago, God spoke to me and said, your healing comes from me. You know, God was speaking. He said, your healing comes from me. And of course I know that. But I, have, I can look for healing from, you know, like reestablishing better relationships or communicating with kids or just I can try to stir up healing in myself. But I want us to have a moment where faith arises and people who are facing the impossible get prayed for by people who have the gift of faith and the gift of healing. So let's first sing. Holy Spirit, we ask you to come and move. This isn't me. This is your body. I pray, Lord, that we would um, be who we are in you as we minister to one another in this moment. I know you like Jim Zoko. I know you like to pray for healing. And if anybody wants prayer for that way, or if anybody else feels that they want to pray a prayer of faith, <clears throat> but come forward. And then if you'd like prayer, Ingrid and Peter, you guys come and pray. You pray with faith every week. Um, and then we want to invite whoever would like prayer for whatever circumstance in their life to be prayed for. I want to pray. So I'm going to pray. For online folks. I just felt that. And then we're going to kind of continue through the song and then we will uh, wrap up and we can have people come for prayer. But Father God, today uh, I pray for anybody that's watching us uh, online that feels they're up against an impossible situation. Lord, we pray for that need this morning. You're the God of the impossible. You're the God who makes crooked paths straight. You're the God who uh, exalts valleys and brings mountains down low. So we pray for that circumstance this morning, Lord. We pray for those that may be watching that feel that they are up against. And as they uh, reach out to you in faith, Lord, I pray that you would come and meet them there. And you would build confidence and hope. You would bring them to a path that brings them through their circumstances, oh God. Be their source, be their strength, be their hope. We pray in Christ's name. Hallelujah. Father, uh, as we get ready to go, anybody else would like prayer, we'd love to have you come now. They'd love to pray with you uh, for whatever the need is. Physical, whatever it might be. Father, uh, we pray for each one. We pray for your peace over your church, and we pray that as we uh, pray and as we begin to uh, go our ways, Lord, that your presence would be here, your grace would be filling every heart and every life with your presence, your likeness, your hope, your joy, your peace, and your love. And we thank you for that in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Please come and pray. pray. They'd love to. Your plans for me, huh? 
Worship you, Lord. 